Hello, I'm Chris Alvarez, and welcome to Spacewalks Money Talks, where we talk about the business, technology, and policy of space exploration and commercialization. Thank you for listening. I'm speaking with Christopher Wanjek, author of Spacefarers, How Humans Will Settle the Moon, Mars, and Beyond, uh, published by Harvard University Press, and the date is given as April 14th of this year. Is that the same, or has it been pushed April 14th. Okay. I know the vibe. All systems go. (laughs) All right. Um, All right. Well, thank you for speaking with me. Hey, thank you for having me. This is a thrill. I mean, I have to to say uh, that the breadth of your knowledge is truly impressive. You know, from space to military history to esoteric nerd stuff. I'm a little intimidated. (laughs) No, no. You go easy on me, but I've seen some, I've listened to some of the people you've had on the show they're real experts so i hope i can keep up with you oh yeah no i'm, I'm sure you'll do great um mm. so um first uh what's your background in the field of space uh it's not there much at all i'm a you know i'm really a, a writer i'm a journalist mm-hmm. my uh background in space really is my uh, 10 years at nasa mm-hmm. and uh i had a i was at nasa space goddard flight Cent- nasa goddard space flight center in uh, Greenbelt, Maryland, mm-hmm. and I had this envious title there. I was the senior writer for the structure and evolution of the universe. Hmm. So you don't you don't mess with that title right there. No, that's so <laughs> my my whole beat was high energy astrophysics, and I really learned a lot about black holes and neutron stars. Uh, but of course, I really got into all things space and all things NASA. It's just a incredible place to work. Oh yeah, I'm sure I'm sure it was. Um, so let's talk about the book then. How does it, how, how do you break it down? Um, what do you focus well, on? Well, let me, yeah, okay, how do I break it down? Um, I wanted to take a real practical approach to this. You know, um, one reviewer uh, said that I was, quote, no wide-eyed Trekkie. <laughs> and I really <laughs> love that. I, I think that's true. I really love space. I would love for us to be out there in many more ways. You know, but some of these plans that we have, uh, to get into space uh, just you know just aren't that practical Mm -hmm. so I wanted to take a look at the practical ways of getting into space I mean we've been to the moon Mm -hmm. and we're not there now for a good reason there's no need to be there there hasn't been a need anyway Mm -hmm. so where can that need come from and you talk about you know human adventure and and this uh, you know wanting to conquer all types of things and get to the top of Mount Everest because it's there but we don't live on Mount Everest (laughs) Mm -hmm. and we don't live on the moon until we come up with a reason to live on the moon or live in space we're not going to be out there and is it all dependent on so there there are two motivators it seems that everyone keeps coming back to you know one is uh, sort of the military one, which isn't as strong as it was during the space race, but I think it's still there. And then there's the economic motivation, which is, can we make money off of, you know, mining from space? You know, that's the big thing or tourism. Yes. You nailed it, Chris. I think, uh, I think tourism is going to come first. It's happening now. Mm -hmm. And, and mining is, is a strong possibility. I think Uh, mining is making sense once uh, the access to space gets a little cheaper. And that military stuff, you know, the space race, uh, China is scaring us Mm -hmm. in a good way. You know, they're doing some remarkable things in space. They've had, what, two space stations that no one's talking about. They're Mm -hmm. ready to build a third one Mm -hmm. uh, the size of Mir. You know, they're doing it all on their own. That's, Mm -hmm. that's, you know, impressive stuff. And they've been to the far side of the moon and uh, put a rover on the moon that lasted a long time, too. You know, that's stuff that's uh, very impressive, and it's uh, making people in the United States nervous. And it's strange that they're not uh, publicizing it uh, in such a way that you might expect. Um, You think so? I don't know what the scene is. And I would imagine in China is a sense of enormous pride. Mm -hmm. I saw this video. I probably have an MP3 someplace. Um, You know, it was like a perfect NASA video with, a, you know, the rockets flaring and then the flames coming out and the rocket going up there and going to the moon. And all of a sudden you hear somebody speaking in Chinese, like, whoa, mm-hmm. this is different, isn't it? <laughs> and it was the total Chinese perspective on it. And it was for the Chinese market. And uh, I think this is a major sense of pride. And I 
that perhaps it's not being covered in the United States because it's a, a little bit embarrassing. That that's what I was going to ask. That maybe there's that mm -hmm. issue. But I mean, China always could always um, put out a lot of uh, advertising in English. You know, I think they have the resources to do that. But I, I don't True. see that. You know, I don't mm -hmm. see that press. So, so it's it's and also a previous interview I did. Um, India. <laughs> Is a competitor. Oh, yeah, I heard that one. Yeah, they're coming along, aren't they? Yeah. So, um, so it's interesting that you have it's no longer just uh, a, a race between two powers. You know, there are a oh. bunch involved. That's right. I feel that it's a lot like the so called uh, ice race to Antarctica. Hmm. And I think there's incredible overlaps between the moon and Antarctica. When you think about Antarctica, you know, when people first started exploring it, it was at the turn of the century, 1900. And we, we went around, we got to the poles, and then we left it essentially for 50-some years mm -hmm. because it was just too darn cold down there, right? It couldn't mm -hmm. do much down there. Yeah. But then the technology allowed more and more nations to get there in the 1950s, and suddenly everyone wanted to be there. It's like 13, 14, 15 countries there now. Well, same as the moon, you know? We, we raced to the moon, we did a little uh, exploration for a couple years, and then we've left it, left it for 50 years. We're right back uh, where we were with Antarctica. And now all these nations want to get to the moon. India does. Absolutely. The European uh, Space Agency does. China does. They all have plans. They all have eyes on the moon. Um, it makes me wonder how are people, I think, I don't know if you just said it or maybe I read in a, mm -hmm. your book blurb, but, um, you know, these are inhospitable environments that... Um, that we're talking about people moving to and living and working in. Um, how do you really get people out there? You know, do conditions here on the earth have to be so terrible that they'll take the, you know, job in such a difficult <laughs> condition? Or, you know, how does that work? Um, again, let's go back to Antarctica. I think it's going to be a lot like that when we're talking about the moon. Mm -hmm. um, in Antarctica, you have these uh, crews that overwinter. Um, they're skeleton crews, although the U.S. presence is relatively large. I think there's upwards of a couple hundred people there. And then in the so-called summer, um, thousands come down, mostly scientists and uh, engineers and such doing experiments. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they leave after three months, and that skeleton crew remains. And they might be there for a year, two years, three years, usually not much longer. Mm -hmm. There's incredible sense of adventure and certain awesomeness of being in antarctica mm -hmm. that certainly drives people the pay is great you got very little to spend your money on <laughs> so you're really <laughs> banking a lot and i see the moon being a lot like that i see first of course the astronauts um the original explorers followed by scientists um who are going to go there for maybe a couple months at a time as they would to uh antarctica uh, but you're going to have some type of support, a real skeleton crew that would be attracted to live on the moon for a year or two, not reside there. Mm -hmm. But uh, depending on what our biology can take um, to spend a couple years on the moon, I, I think it would be an awesome experience for anyone in their 20s or 30s or maybe even their 40s mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, to get that under their belt. That would be really cool, I think. Mm-hmm. And then the tourists, right? The, the, now there's uh, tourists getting down to Antarctica, uh, you know, after the explorers, after the scientists, and uh, same on the moon. I think there's going to be uh, some tourists that could be able to get there in maybe, you know, 15, 20 years. So in your in the book blurb, um, mm -hmm. it does, uh, it mentions, you know, Mars and uh, people, you know, question of, you know, can people reproduce and, and raise healthy children there? Mm. And again, it makes me wonder, you know, are would the best and the brightest go out to Mars and, and brave, you know, these conditions, you know, because mm. that seems, you know, that's pretty dangerous to, to start asking, well, are we going to start having children, you know, on Mars? And, and, <laughs> exactly. You know. exactly. Yeah. One thing to sit out <laughs> by yourself, but to, to bring the kids along or to <laughs> raise a family out there. Yeah. Uh, right. You know, it depends on who you talk to and, and you no doubt know uh, Robert Zubrin. Mm -hmm. And his case for Mars was just brilliant. And you read that book and you're like, yeah, we can do this. We can do it tomorrow. We can do it today. Um, he's really, really convincing. Um, and then a week will go by after reading it. And I'm thinking, well, maybe it's not that easy. <laughs> As I'm reading it, it's really easy. Um, right, right. What is the incentive 
for Mars. You're going to have that initial uh, sense of exploration. Um, and as Zubrin would say, it's the new world, you know, this analogy between uh, the old world coming over to the Americas for new for newfound fortunes and, um, and a lot of land that's wide open for you to claim. All that's true, but what will be those fortunes? Unless there is a real economic reason for families to go out there, mm -hmm. uh, once the biology is proven, once 38, 39 percent gravity is okay uh, to uh, raise a family, what would drive people there? And that's really not clear. There's a fascination with Mars, but what would actually drive the families in the way that the Mayflower families came over? Mm -hmm. Don't know. And I'm going to pose a question, and I'm not mm. I'm not taking a stand either way or trying to make it political, but mm -hmm. considering that um, all the treaties have said that space is basically um, a, a common resource, you know, and no right. one can really own a part of space, you know, you're not going to be able to tell people you know, you'll get 10 acres of Mars if you are willing to live there and, and develop it. You know, that's uh, currently is, is the treaty stand that can't happen. Um, so so that in incentive is not not there. Um, mm -hmm. It's just that. So I'm just kind of thinking out loud now, mm. you know. Yeah. Well, you know, in my opinion, when the when the rubber hits the regolith, you know, <laughs> that treaty is going to go <laughs> out the window. Um so, you know, quite recently, uh, maybe this past week, uh, the president um, signed something. I'm not even exactly clear what it was, but that would give uh, the United States the right to mine on the moon. Mm -hmm. um, and that's interesting and I think appropriate. It's not entirely new. I mean, Obama in 20, uh, 2015, it was, yes, he, it was the Space Act. Um, see, spurring private aerospace competitiveness and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they that more or less said, you know, that's that the Outer Space Treaty from 1967. That's nice. Maybe we're not going to own the moon, but we can uh, mine it and make money off of it. Mm -hmm. Luxembourg has a similar uh, plan mm -hmm. to do so, and I because I don't think you can get out there uh, and have. I don't think you can expect companies or people. Uh, to um, go to these places if there's no chance of making money there. Mm -hmm. And already, just that, what you just mentioned, um, to me, if, if countries aren't careful, if people aren't careful, or if companies aren't careful, that you're laying the foundation for future uh, armed conflict. You know, it, it's... I don't know, maybe you I'm are, cynical. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I mean, well, that, that's the history of the world, isn't it? You, yeah. you know that better than I do. And yet, yeah, how do you control that? You might know that there's, in addition to the Outer Space Treaty that, oh, I don't know, 170 nations have signed, there's also something called the Moon Treaty mm -hmm. uh, that the United States and every country that can get into space has not signed. It's signed by Brazil and, and, and a lot of other smaller nations, uh, economically smaller nations, mm -hmm. because they're a bit worried. And that moon treaty essentially states that no one is allowed to profit uh, from these uh, lunar sources, or um, not that they can't profit, but that profit has to be shared equally among all of humanity. However, <laughs> you get your three cent check, I guess. I don't know how that would work out. Uh, but no spacefaring nation has signed that treaty for that very reason. It's just not uh, tenable. Um, but yeah, how do you prevent wars? You know, that's, that's pretty tricky. The moon is a big place. Maybe, you know, it's about the size of uh, Asia or Africa. But there's choice locations there, aren't there? You know, on the on the South Pole, you have these crater rims that are elevated and have this uh, perpetual light mm -hmm. you know 20 to 24 hours a day or essentially constant light that you could use for solar pow uh, power mm -hmm. that's a very and there's not many of them and <laughs> that's that's a very uh that's choice real estate right there who gets that if you're not allowed to own the moon who gets to be there and who, who can tap into uh, the water that's there yeah. open-ended questions and I, I hate to see it turn into a uh, armed conflict right so i guess people should just be aware that 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 danger exists and hopefully address it yes you know i i think that humans have evolved 
you know, in the past 300, 200 years. I mean, I think there are, they say there are less armed conflicts <laughs> these days. It's hard to believe, but I, I think, you know, in the uh, race, the colonialism period was particularly brutal. And I don't see that, uh, I'm a bit optimistic here, I don't see that as much these days, you know, when um, the president suggested buying Greenland, for example, mm -hmm. that was scoffed at, not because it wasn't a practical idea. Yeah, right. We would be great to own Greenland. We couldn't do it because, oh, right, there's people living there. And mm -hmm. we don't buy places like that anymore, like we did with uh, Alaska. Mm -hmm. That was feasible uh, 150 years ago. Those kind of things aren't feasible now because I think uh, humanity has moved on and has a better appreciation for their fellow human beings. So maybe that will save us a little bit in space. Yeah, I do. I do see that that trend where, yeah, conflict is not as common, not as brutal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I see that as well. More communication. Um, mm -hmm. I think people see themselves. There's more commonalities seen than differences in general. I think you're right, Chris. So let's kind of backtrack from the big these big questions um, and go more in the weeds. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> what challenges, and this kind of open-ended how you want to answer it, um, what challenges mm -hmm. in space business, technology, or policy are you most concerned about and why as far as making these things happen? Okay. That's, uh, I think there are two interesting challenges uh, that no one's really talking about yet because it hasn't come up yet, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's going to be uh, big in the long run. Mm -hmm. uh, one is the gravity issue. You know, um, we don't know anything uh, about partial gravity on the human body. We have two data points. We, uh, we on Earth here, we, have, we experience normal gravity, we call it normal, 1G. And in space, of course, uh, in the International Space Station and in uh, uh, orbit, it's a free fall called zero gravity, microgravity, uh, in precise terms, but essentially it's zero G. Mm -hmm. And that's bad, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so how do, they, how do you connect those two points on a graph? Is it a linear connection between zero and one that the more gravity you have, the better? Is it kind of concave that, you know, you need upwards of 80, 90 percent of gravity before you can be healthy or or is 10, 20 percent enough? Uh, no one knows. We have no idea. So all these ideas for space just assume that all is well. You know, you can <laughs> reside on, on Mars with 39 percent gravity and you can reside on the moon for however long for 16 percent gravity. That's an open ended question. Uh, so that could kill all ideas aside from these orbiting uh, spheres in space, these O'Neill uh, cylinders, uh, or orbiting hotels, uh, so you create an artificial gravity. Um, that would work. It's a little challenging to do, but that's the only way to get around the gravity issue. Mm -hmm. Because I guess all the um, proposed solutions for that, you know, as far as maintaining bone density and strength and mm. all that, that's still all, I guess, really just theoretical. Um, That's right. It's very frustrating for me to see what NASA is doing. You know, the International Space Station, of course, is was created to be a zero gravity uh, laboratory. <laughs> so they, you know, NASA doesn't test for <laughs> things that aren't zero gravity. And but they've gone in a direction where they, you know, they're planning for these space missions and sending astronauts to Mars and such, and they try to find ways to mitigate the effects of zero gravity, be it some type of exercise regime or medicines to help with the uh, bone loss issue or the uh, eyesight problem, you know, your, um, your eyesight gets terrible in space. Um, but instead, you know, they could be investing in some type of artificial gravity, <laughs> a spaceship that rotates uh, on itself uh, over and over again on the way to Mars that would eliminate the need to do anything. Because I don't think the future of mankind uh, is going to be in zero gravity. <laughs> it's like trying to learn how to breathe underwater. You know, you <laughs> get out of the, don't, don't be underwater for too long, you'll drown. <laughs> and same as space, it's like, you know, get through it as best you can and <laughs> get to where you want to go. Huh. And then you said there was a second uh, issue? Yeah, and I think this is pretty interesting to me. I haven't heard anyone talk about that, this, and it's um, noise. You know, you know how loud a, a rocket launch is, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you get 
millions of people in the space. How do you turn it into something like a, uh, an airplane ride? Um, how do you had even get thousands of people in the space. Uh, that would, you know, to get thousands of people in the space, you would require many launches every day. And these things are so loud that uh, you wouldn't be able to place them anywhere without the, the citizens in that area <laughs> being up in arms. Hmm. You know, we have this view of the future. You know, you, you see these um, science fiction films and, you know, the rockets are just or the spaceships are just gracefully coming into the planet and gracefully leaving the planet. And it's all very quiet and serene. <laughs> but that's not that's obviously not the reality. You're coming in at, you know, twenty five thousand miles an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, you're you're you know, you're fat, you know, 20 Mach 25. You have um, sonic booms. Uh, you can't avoid that noise unless you unless we build some type of system you know these space elevator or some of these other far-flung ideas to uh lift us up in the space you would need a whole different kind of infrastructure but we cannot go back and forth to space in any large number uh with rockets from spaceports yeah that's um yeah that's a good point uh, um do you see any issues or challenges again either in business mm -hmm. tech or policy that could actually be fixed or addressed pretty easily that people aren't aren't taken care of. Um, yeah. So with the policy, I think uh, I, I think it's the right thing with the the, the current president or the, or the Space Act that Obama signed into to law. You have to incentivize incentivize businesses or uh, entrepreneurs to be willing to go out there, knowing they can uh, get a massive profit to take on something high risk you're going to want high reward so if you can't uh guarantee that high, or if you can't allow those folks to have a high reward you're not going to have anyone taking a high risk to get out there and and let's face it nasa hasn't done particularly well <laughs> in getting to the moon uh it, it, companies like spacex are doing much better mm -hmm. so if you can continue to incentivize uh entrepreneurs to look to space, uh, I think a lot, a lot is going to open up, and I think access to space is going to be much cheaper. So in terms of policy, uh, yes, allowing uh, people to profit, regardless of what the um, Outer Space Treaty says. It's worded, of course, the treaty is worded in such a way that it doesn't specifically say you're not allowed to make money out there. It just says you can't own anything. Mm -hmm. um, but that's yeah. a curious situation. You know, they talk about mining asteroids for water and the minerals. So in theory, you could land on an asteroid, mine it down to a little crumb, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you never own what you just uh, completely cannibalized. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think the policy has to change to allow people to, uh, to, to profit and to own things out in space. So I'm not sure this question, mm -hmm. it might be outside of the scope of the book um, mm -hmm. and maybe what you've researched, but, but I'll ask mm -hmm. and see. Um, mm -hmm. so, when, so as far as incentivizing these mm -hmm. uh, big risks, I, I see sort of two different ways you can do it and maybe you can do both, which is one, you know, you support the big companies, you know, like maybe Boeing or SpaceX um, or Blue Origin, um, mm -hmm. you know, you can say, hey, we're, your, your losses can be written off and this and that. And then you also have the small, the small engineering shops, which are trying new technologies, you know, do they get incentives as well? Or you, do you depend on the big companies to reach out to them and just kind of incorporate it all? You know, how much, how much do you, um, uh, centralize this decision-making with these small, these small number of big companies versus the small scientist? Yeah, you, you are right. That That is beyond uh, what I've researched. And that's why I was particularly fascinated by um, a conversation you had with uh, Rod Pyle, mm -hmm. the editor of uh, Ad Astra. Mm -hmm. um, I was like, and that was November. And I was like, uh, well, I wish I'd listened to this before I wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, he was bringing up these interesting ideas. You, you and he were doing so. And, um, you know, the, the degree that... Uh, 
uh, Boeing uh, and um, these other large places are essentially subsidized by the military to um, stay in business and, and, and keep the rockets ready in case we need them is uh, extraordinary. Um, and it's really ultimately unfair <laughs> to these startups. Mm-hmm. Um, in the book, I uh, kind of compare SpaceX and Blue Origin, um, or SpaceX in particular, to uh, Toyota circa 1960 or so, you know, and it, it studied Ford and studied GM and did it better. And it came up out of nowhere and became the number one uh, car manufacturer because uh, they were nimble. And, mm. and GM and Ford, the big three, uh, Chrysler, they were just set in their old ways and they couldn't uh, um, invent new ways or more efficient ways to be lean. And Toyota really taught the world a lesson. I think that's happening with some of these startups. Uh, so if we can encourage that f- freedom to, um, can't think of the word that I want, uh, to innovate, mm. the freedom to innovate, uh, to encourage that with, I don't know, tax brackets or uh, tax uh, breaks, I mean, or, or even contests uh, like uh, Google uh, had put out to try to get people to get to the moon to win a $25 million prize. I think these could be effective ways to get uh, new people into the field. New people bring new ideas and, and open up new efficiencies. Mm-hmm. That would be my take on it. Okay. So you kind of mentioned uh, a couple of things that people aren't talking about yet. Mm-hmm. Um, are there other, in space ex- exploration and commercialization, are there other issues that people aren't talking about that they should be discussing? I guess so. You have to, I, I think the mining issue is is interesting there's lots of uh money out there but what that really mean you know you talk about these asteroids that are you know 30 quadrillion dollars worth of (laughs) platinum (laughs) and uh that's nice but you bring that back and it kind of crashes the platinum market so you know Mm. is is it are these are, are the values that people are placing on these uh truly real that's something to start thinking about um and um, I guess one other thing I'd like to think about is this idea of mining. The more you can do off Earth, I think the better, because mining is horrific uh, to the environment. Mm-hmm. I mean, it it's, uh, creates a lot of jobs, yes, but in parts of the world, you know, it's tied to exploitation and child labor. Cobalt is a, is a, is a horrible problem in, in Africa. The rare earth metals that are in the rare earth elements that are in uh, smartphones, I think they have like 20 some. Uh, these little, uh, these these minerals that we have that take such a, uh, a great toll on, on humanity in terms of uh, uh, human health and the environment mm-hmm. um, need to be overcome. And, and I think space can provide that because uh, these these minerals exist in great abundances in the asteroids. Uh, in fact, that's why they're on Earth because asteroids have crashed over, <laughs> crashed on Earth through the millennia, and yeah. we're just scooping up the remains of it. Yeah. That's where all this stuff is coming from originally. So if we could tap into that, not I mean the profit is there, but just to raise the standard of living for so many people to create these new resources, so we wouldn't have to be strip mining and and just ruining so much land i think that would be a wonderful thing does your book um since your book does talk about um tourism and mining Mm -hmm. do you talk about uh having that having construction done out in space rather than here on earth and having stuff launched out yeah so that would be that would be uh the key to everything right if you really want large spacecraft uh try to get it done in in space and that's where the resources resources on the moon become most valuable you, you might know about this idea of mining ice which sounds like mm-hmm. why would you mine ice uh how many uh, mar- uh drinks are you going to make uh but you you do know uh quite well that you know a water h2o contains the hydrogen and the oxygen and you can essentially make a rocket fuel from that and there has been value placed on that fuel, you know, uh, you know, a gallon of uh, gallon of water on Earth, you know, is about a dollar, but a gallon of water on the International Space Station, because they have to launch it up there, you know, costs about ten thousand mm-hmm. um, dollars. 
So likewise, if you could create a fuel up there uh, that a rocket can therefore launch more lightly off of Earth and then fill up these gas, you know, have gas stations essentially in space, uh, that would be a marvelous plan uh, to um, be able to explore deeper into the universe. And likewise, if you could use those, um, the iron and the silicon, to build structures in space instead of launching that heavy stuff from Earth, uh, that would be a wonderful resource as well, because it would be far cheaper to actually launch it off the moon as far away as that is, 250,000 miles, to have that come back to low Earth orbit, which is only you know 200 miles above us. It, caught, it would be less money to do that, launch it from the moon mm -hmm. <laughs> than it is from Earth to get the same amount of weight up there. Mm -hmm. So that would be a great way to build um, big structures in space, yes. I'm speaking with Christopher Wanjek, author of Spacefarers. You can find him at ChristopherWanjek.com. If you like this podcast, please rate it on whatever podcast feed you're listening to it on. If you'd like more information on space exploration and commercialization, Please like, comment, and follow me at SpacewalksMoneyTalks.com, on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at SpacewalksMoneyTalks, and on Twitter at SpacewalksMT. If you like military history, please check out the podcast Military History Inside Out, also located at WarScholar.org. If you like science fiction, fantasy, and horror, please check out the podcast Full Contact Nerd, also located at ChrisAlvarez.com and FullContactNerd.com. Now back to the podcast. What about the question of radiation? That always seems to be mm. a big one that people, you know, that's the last problem and everyone shakes their head and uh, radiation. Yeah. Radiation is a problem, but not so much with low Earth orbit because we're still in the magnetosphere and um, the International Space Station is gets more irradiated than we do here on Earth, but it's not horrible but once you get past those van allen belts uh man it's 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 open season um and that's that's hard to overcome and, and you might know there are two basic kinds of radiation a kind of a solar radiation mm -hmm. and a cosmic radiation solar radiation of course from the sun is not so hard to protect yourself from you can get enough um thickness on your spacecraft uh, even uh, with water, um, to protect yourself from that solar radiation. And perhaps in a solar flare, if you're traveling out to Mars and there was a solar flare, uh, you get a warning and you know these solar particles are coming at your spaceship, not at the speed of light, but you know quite fast, but you might have an hour or two to protect yourself. You could go to a particularly sheltered place in your spacecraft in the kitchen maybe, you know, um, surrounded by a lot of food and water, that would protect you. Um, so I think you could get away with not being harmed from the solar radiation in space. But what is worse is the cosmic radiation. These are little bits of atomic particles from across the universe, essentially, and across the galaxy by shore. Uh, these are so energetic uh, and, and they're constantly racing through your body. You may have heard of tales of um, the astronauts on their trip to the moon were constantly seeing these sparks in their eyes, you know, at a rate of like a couple times per minute. They get these little flashes and they were kind of different for the different astronauts. Sometimes they saw them as a streak and other ones as kind of a flash. These were cosmic rays going through their eyes creating a cascade of light <laughs> wow. and it's not just going through their eyes it's going through their whole body it's slicing up their entire body mm -hmm. and you know back to the to the moon and back um that's one thing but to be out and spit out in for nine months on a trip to mars with these cosmic rays you just can't protect yourself uh unless you have major amounts of, uh, of lead or, <laughs> or water. I mean, you need some mass around you mm -hmm. to uh, diminish them. And it gets to a point where, you know, the, that much mass is just too expensive to get to Mars. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, no, there's no way around that other than to get to Mars faster or to get, it's like I said earlier about, you know, uh, being underwater is dangerous while being in space is dangerous. And the only way around this is to 
you know, get to your destination as quickly as possible. Once on Mars, well, you know, you from in terms of cosmic radiation, you have half of Mars protecting you, right? Because, hmm. you know, the cosmic rays are coming from every single direction in the universe. So anything underneath your feet is going to be blocked by the whole planet of Mars. So there's no problem there. So immediately your uh, dose of cosmic radiation has been cut in half. Hmm. And then on Mars, you may be living underground or something like that. So that would protect much more. Uh, it's just in space. Is you're just a sitting duck for cosmic rays, and that's that's bad news. Have there been any? Has there been any testing as far as ways to protect against it, or has it just been research showing how bad it is? Um, research showing how bad it is, definitely. Um, not particularly great studies because it's hard to reproduce because these cosmic rays are so energetic. Um, there was one study that got a lot of press, but in the end, it's really kind of a stupid study. <laughs> and what they did is they bombarded mice with um, the expected dose of uh, cosmic radiation and, uh, you know, looked at them and, and found that, uh, yeah, they were kind of messed up and their decision processing was messed up. Uh, it, it didn't uh, bode well for their long term health. But it was all about the dose. What they gave was like the entire dose of Mars <laughs> over the course of uh, like a day <laughs> um, because you couldn't put a mouse in a centrifuge <laughs> and fire cosmic rays at it for nine months. It would just be too expensive to do. Yeah. Um, so it's it's all about the dose. I mean, you could drink six beers in one hour and get kind of drunk. You can six, six, drink six beers in six days and not be drunk, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't a good study in the end, and there's no way to do a good study other than to send out your human guinea pigs, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. yeah, and there are, you know, funky ways to try to protect, uh, you know, because we're not, we don't get the cosmic rays on Earth because we have this magnetosphere and the cosmic rays are positively or negatively charged, and, and they're, they're deflected before hitting deeply into the Earth. Some get into the upper atmosphere, mm -hmm. uh, but very few uh, get down to the, the surface. Mm -hmm. Well, they're thinking, you know, could you make some type of electric field around a spacecraft? And CERN in, in, um, in Switzerland is working on that um, to essentially create, I don't know if you can call it a force field, but mm -hmm. an electrical current around the space so when a uh, around the spacecraft, so when a cosmic ray starts approaching it, it kind of goes off in a different direction because it's the, like a, a magnet that it's, it gets repelled by the magnetic uh, by the electric force, electromagnetic force. Hmm. Decades yeah. away, but it's very promising. Yeah, and I guess uh, microparticles are a danger, but not as dangerous as cosmic rays. They're not as plentiful, I don't think. That's right. Yeah. The cosmic rays are, I guess, in theory, uh, atomic particles, <laughs> micro, micro, <laughs> now right. beyond, below nanoparticles, nanoparticles, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the micrometeorites on Mars, or excuse me, on the moon without its atmosphere, um, they would, that, that's, they're constantly raining down on you as well, aren't they? Hmm. And uh, you, you need um, to be in a shelter that's, you know, a good, five uh, meters thick to really protect yourself from from these kind of this kind of radiation and, and the micrometeorite damage that's why i'm always fascinated by these you know the science fiction with these uh beautiful uh domes you know with their <laughs> massive glass structures you know and they're glowing like a a, a night <laughs> a lamp uh, at nighttime it's so beautiful looking mm -hmm. but they would just be shattered <laughs> over the course of a couple of weeks from all the micrometeorites i'm sure <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So uh, you mentioned tourism, though. Tourism, yeah. I think, is 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 going to happen in, in very fun ways. I see that. So, and yet these these dangers we just talked about. Um, yes, makes me wonder again. Even with tourism, I guess if you stay within the um, sort of our extended atmosphere, you have some protection. That's right. Um, um, you stay within the atmosphere. Uh, the yeah the the magnetosphere, mm -hmm. um, and um, you uh, you're only up there for a week or two at a time. So that much your dose isn't that high mm -hmm. uh, compared to uh, yeah a two three year trip to Mars. 
Um, so it, that, that shouldn't be that bad, right? The radiation from that kind of trip a week in space. Mm-hmm. Maybe like a CAT scan worth. Okay. Sometimes I, CT. It, <laughs> the, um, when I think of tourism too, the, uh, you know, those, those NASA posters they did, you know, with the, you know, skiing on the moon of whatever. And, you right. know. <laughs> um, but you know, I mean, this is, this is unfolding right now. Um, you know, Robert Bigelow, uh, with, the um, with the Bigelow enterprises, I, I forget the name of their actual company. Mm-hmm. So Robert Bigelow, the CEO of, uh, the budget suites, uh, billionaire, um, he's, uh, investing heavily, uh, in these space technologies and he's making these inflatable hotels, uh, these inflatable shelters. Um, his prototype is called the beam. B-E-A-M, uh, that stands for something that I can't remember off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he already launched that. And this is what's the great part. He launched that with SpaceX, you know, company to company business for the first time in space mm-hmm. and not a military contract. So he uses a SpaceX rocket to get the beam launched to the International Space Station uh, circa 2015. Mm-hmm. And they attached this uh, inflatable uh, shelter onto the International Space Station. And they tested it out, and it was holding up just as well as the rest of the space station in terms of uh, the radiation that might get in. Uh, now it's still there, and NASA just uses it for storage, essentially. Um, but that these are inflatable, meaning you know they're very light uh, and very um, they're much cheaper to launch. And mm-hmm. he is now coming up with a prototype right now that he plans to launch in about, you know, by 2025, just in a few years. He's you know, And these it will be twin inflatable um, shelters that combined would be larger than all the ISS, the living space in the ISS, minus the uh, solar panels and such. It would have more <laughs> living space uh, than the International Space Station. And you might remember the International Space Station cost, you know, $150 billion to, mm-hmm. to, uh, to launch and to, to build uh, mm-hmm. because of all that stuff that you're putting up there. Mm-hmm. These are just, you know, essentially inflatable Kevlar bags. I don't know. I, I think they're partially Kevlar. I don't know the entire uh, material. Mm-hmm. Um, so what do you do with that? So. You know, if you can get a, a, a inexpensive access to space via SpaceX, you could rocket up there for, you know, a couple tens of millions of dollars. You and I can't afford it. Many people can. Um, you could go up there for just a week at a time. Before zero gravity gets annoying and unhealthy, you could have a lot of fun in that little hotel. Um, and you can even envision uh, movie producers or um, people making uh, music videos, shooting up the actors up there, right? And Mm -hmm. then they could probably make their money back from the publicity on that. They could do all these types of uh, zero gravity activities Mm -hmm. um, just for a few tens of millions of dollars. And that we're going to see that in about five years. That's really cool. And that's the birth of the space hotel industry, (laughs) essentially. Baron Hilton um came up with this idea back in 1967 <laughs> he huh. presented it back then it didn't go anywhere but he wanted the lunar the lunar hilton um hey. but it, it could come to that the, the an actual hotel on the moon maybe in i don't know 30 years but before that they will be inflatable hotels in five or ten years you're gonna have to allow uh, gambling casino gambling as well exactly. to really make it interesting <laughs> well yeah if you can just get a little bigger um, before you get to the moon, I think there's, you start with these inflatables, but you can envision in this, I don't think it's too far fetched. Uh, like I said, in the book, I try to separate the things that are just crazy, you know, doesn't, don't break laws of physics, but who's really going to do that mm. to, yeah, maybe this could happen. If you could get a structure up there, you know, a giant wheel of sorts with spokes and such, and it's rotating, mm-hmm. If you can envision a torus, a rotating torus, mm-hmm. uh, so on, on the outer edges, as this is flipping around at a rate of about four times per minute or so, and the whole thing is maybe about the size of a stadium, 100 uh, yards in diameter, 
um, you know, the outer edges are providing that artificial gravity. Mm -hmm. So th it's there you could sleep and eat, mm -hmm. eat like a, you know, a civilized human being, <laughs> not out of a, you know, floating around with a sippy cup. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, and maybe gamble too. Yeah. And then you, you walk through those spokes to the central area. And as you're walking through those spokes to that central area, mm -hmm. gravity gets lower and lower until you're zero gravity in the center. And that could be your zero gravity fun house mm -hmm. uh, that you play in, you know, for a couple hours <laughs> and then, you know, go back to your, uh, your room or your, uh, or the, uh, the dining hall, the bar or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that, that could definitely happen. And then they develop a professional sports team for whatever interesting sport they come up with. In, you know, humans like humans are amazing. I'm sure that will follow. Yes. <laughs> so uh, the space league, yeah. Yes, the space league. You should coin that term now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's uh, distinct enough, but uh, uh -huh. maybe. Um, I'm sure someone has the that World website. World Series, the Galactic Series. <laughs> so. Uh, We've talked a lot about space. What what excites you most about space? What excites me most, and it's a bit dreamy, um, but it's what I was getting at a little earlier about the betterment of humankind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, space it has infinite resources. And right now on Earth, there are finite resources. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're faced with two we're faced with a decision on Earth. We can either say, okay, we have finite resources on Earth. That means we really have to limit and even reduce the population. And any new person being born is a person who is going to be using that resource. So that person is essentially an enemy uh, mm. to me. That person in that country who wants to drive, who wants to own a car, who wants to do these things like America does, and they not do it right now because of uh, they're too poor. Uh, if that country becomes an economic powerhouse, they're going to be using resources and they're going to be threatening Earth. So you come up with a situation where everyone is an enemy and you're fighting over resources. That's one future uh, if we don't go out in space. Hmm. You know, the other future is you tap in to those infinite resources that are out there. And then suddenly it's a reverse. Every human born is a human that is contributing to ideas. Uh, and it has an infinite potential uh, that can bring us to this higher level of tapping into the space resources and bringing them back to Earth or even using them out in space to explore deeper to build uh, massive solar panels in space, to beam the energy down here. Mm -hmm. That's a major undertaking, but that could be done, and that would free up amazing amounts of resources on Earth. You wouldn't have to worry about energy, uh, and you could be saving the waterways. I mean, there's so much potential. So that's what excites me about space, the potential to help humanity. I don't think living on Mars is a plan B for Earth. You know, like some people say, you know, if we're going to hit by an asteroid, there's going to be a nuclear war. We have to be on another planet by that point. Mm -hmm. I don't think so because the Earth hasn't been destroyed yet. You know, it would take some type of, uh, you know, like Hitchhiker's Guide to, yeah. <laughs> to the universe. You know, the whole planet would have to blow up. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if an asteroid hit a big one, like it, like it wiped out the dinosaurs, of course, that would be horrible. But, you know, a small percentage of the human population would survive underground. And, you know, you could live off of uh, canned beans from an abandoned supermarket for a couple of years. <laughs> that would still be more pleasant than being on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so humanity will survive any crisis on Earth. And being out there on another planet really isn't going to help Earth, except maybe in 200 or 300 years when they're totally self-sufficient and don't need Earth anymore to survive. But that's not going to happen anytime soon. Hmm. Um, so I see space as not as, as a plan B, but as, as just as a way to uh, open up resources on Earth to bring out the humanity of everyone. Yeah, I think for, I wonder some people, maybe it's hard to conceptualize, you know, when you say infinite resources, people, 
still think of, oh, humans are just going to go and make a mess of the next planet or they're just going to make a mm. mess of the system. But but really, space is infinite. You know, there's mm -hmm. I know the solar system is limited, but it's still so huge compared to the little bit that we're uh, inhabiting here on Earth. Right. There's hundreds of millions of asteroids. I mean, if you go small enough, there's probably there's probably billions of asteroids. Everyone could have their own asteroid. <laughs> uh, I mean, it really is infinite. If you add it all up, um, you know, someone calculated that when you add up all the resources in the asteroid belt, you there's enough minerals and water to sustain trillions of people, trillions. Um, when you think of all the, the, the nitrogen and the oxygen and all the things that you would need, it's not necessarily in a form useful to us right now, mm -hmm. but that stuff is out there and that could sustain trillions of people. Hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Where can people find you on the web? Um, well, I'm fortunate that not too many people in North America have the name Wanjek. So, <laughs> so uh, by looking up uh, Wanjek, yeah, it, a couple of things will come up. Mm. I do have a website. Uh, um, it's ChristopherWanjek.com. Mm -hmm. One word, ChristopherWanjek.com. Um, Harvard set up a nice website for me, but it's one of those websites where you doesn't have a nifty URL that I can memorize. Uh, um, mm -hmm. But Wanjek, you know, if you, when you do a search on Wanjek and spacefarers, I think the Harvard uh, University press site comes up. Mm -hmm. I even have a Wikipedia page that uh, someone created for me. Nice. <laughs> um, because I am the, well, I guess I still am. Uh, I write for Mercury Magazine. Mm -hmm. And I am the so-called uh, armchair astrophysicist. <laughs> mm -hmm. I inherited that um, that uh, column, mm -hmm. and it goes back to my NASA days when that was my beat, the high energy astrophysics. So um, someone created a Wikipedia page for me back in the day, and uh, so I'm happy to have that because they're hard to come by. <laughs> uh, I don't know who touches it. Someone they put stuff up there. Um, someone, <laughs> so I used to do, believe it or not, I, I actually, um, through college and graduate school, uh, I was a stand up comic. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, I did comedy <laughs> and I actually wrote a lot of jokes. I actually, actually wrote for Jay Leno as a contributing writer, nice. um, as a bit of a freelancer for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Um, so people get that on there, and then someone said I had an issue with the Pope. I don't know what issue I have <laughs> with the Pope, but it says that I was angry at the Pope's stance on birth control or something. I don't, I don't know, but uh, I don't want to take it off because uh, that looks like censorship or something, so I just leave these things be. So there's a, there's a team, <laughs> a little team of uh, Wikipedians who are monitoring your, your life occasionally. That's right. <laughs> Wow. Okay. And, and so, just for listeners, so they know the spelling. Um, that's Christopher. Yeah. So, yeah. Liller. Christopher with uh, unlike you, I have the H. Mm -hmm. People often say, "Chris, get the H out of here," <laughs> but uh, I, I keep it anyway. So, C H R I S T O P H E R W A N J E K dot com. Cool. Cool. Um, you can get a lot of you can get a lot of uh, free stuff there. I have. Um, before this book, I wrote a uh, quasi-academic book for the International Labor Organization called Food at Work, about workers' nutrition. Hmm. Um, and uh, again, you know, it's academic. Um, it's been an important book for many people. It helped uh, shape some laws about how workers eat around the world. Hmm. Uh, that You can download that freely from the ILO. I have a lot of my live science uh, articles linked from there. Uh, a previous book, Bad Medicine. I have a couple chapters that are available. You can they can read that too. Mm -hmm. So there's stuff to grab there. Okay, nice. So that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? Uh, no, it's it's been a wonderful conversation. I said up front, I was a bit uh, intimidated, uh, but I had a lot of fun <laughs> talking to you. I'm very impressed by your your, your broad knowledge, and uh, you've really made it easy for me to. Uh, uh, speak my mind. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, my goal is to get knowledge out to my listeners. You know, that's my goal. Uh, spread, mm -hmm. spread the ideas and the thinking and, and all that. Um, you do a great job. I'm certainly going to tweet about this one. Thank you. I appreciate it. Wait, so do you have a Twitter feed too? 
Two I people. do, yeah. Wanjek, I think it's <laughs> W-A-N-J-E-K. Again, the beauty of having a name that <laughs> no one else has. So it's like Yahoo. There's some or... Wanjeks in Germany, too. They're probably angry that I got to it before them. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. You know, I appreciate all the kind words. Um, and thank you for speaking with me. Absolutely. Thank you again. Thank you for listening. You can find more podcasts like this on your favorite podcast feed under the title Spacewalks Money Talks. That includes Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. One great way to support me is to rate my podcasts, either good or bad. You can find more fascinating information at SpacewalksMoneyTalks.com, on YouTube under Spacewalks Money Talks, on Facebook under Spacewalks Money Talks, on Instagram under Spacewalks Money Talks, and on Twitter at SpacewalksMT. Don't forget to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I recommend newly published books. The subscription box is on my webpage. Thank you for listening.